this whole village is another world inside a world. Homeless youth come to this area because this is what we know as safe zone. This is where we socialize, we make some mango. By the summer, I'm definitely going to be in house. I can feel it. The police make it seem like they're going to stop prostitution. They're homeless, so they, you know, they turn into this lifestyle. Officer, you want to search me? They just don't like it. Hi, everybody. Welcome to the Queer Network. This is Queer Conversations. I'm Justin Gerhardt. Today's episode is in partnership with the Real Pride Film Festival, which takes place in Winnipeg, Canada. Uh, this year, obviously, like everything else, it is virtual. And we are having a Q&A interview with one of the creators of the film, Peer Kids, which is playing at the festival this year. So please welcome the creator and director, Elegance Bratton. Hello. How are you doing, Elegance? Very good. Justin, how are you? Good. Welcome to the Queer Network and to the Real Pride Film Festival. Thank you for having me. I'm so excited. I'm in Beyonce's whole hometown. That's like... I was, I was going to say, where are you? <laughs> uh, right now, I'm in Dublin, Georgia, on a, on a little break on a road trip for a, a feature documentary I'm finishing off right now. Amazing. So you're in the midst of a new project, which is, which is exciting. Um, can you say anything about it or is it all private secret? These are not private secrets. These are public, public secrets. That's how public I like, secrets. I like my like. secrets. That's how I get down. Nice. Um, but uh, the movie is called Hellfighters. It's about the Harlem Hellfighters. They are the first regiment of black troops to fight in a world war uh, for the United States, World War I. And their leader, James oh. Reese Europe was the most prominent composer, black composer of the early 20th century. He was from the first black musicians wow. union. He was the first black person to play at Carnegie Hall. He also invented jazz and Afro-Latin jazz and brought all of that to France as the first person to bring black American culture to France as a part wow. of the Home Health Fighters band. So this documentary is interested in exploring um, the experience of, of race for black Americans and how in terms of double consciousness, Du Bois's notion mm -hmm. of, of seeing oneself through the eyes of the other, to yep. um, contemplate and comment on the nature, on the on the, the the possibility of black entertainment being a um, a militant exploit, even if it appears to be degrading to black people. Right. Well, lots there, <laughs> lots, lots to dive into. Um, similar to, to the project that we're going to talk about today, also so, much, so many layers and so, so much to talk about with Peer Kids. Um, tell, tell the audience and everybody that's watching at home and everybody that's at the festival, what is Peer Kids about if they haven't seen it yet? Sure. Um, well, first off, thank you for supporting this festival. We need platforms for queer artists and queer artists. We do. Everybody, women, we all need a place to be heard. So thank you for supporting this very important institution. Um, Peer Kids is about three queer and trans black youth who I follow for five years as they try to overcome homelessness by using Christopher Street Pier in West Village of Manhattan. Um, the iconic location of the gay rights movement uh, to to try to find their ways out of homelessness. It's a verite mm -hmm. film. Um, the intention is to help the audience be in the skin of oppression so that they can feel the true feelings that folks like me feel and hopefully at the end of that process imagine a way to make the world better for people like us through uh, you know, seeing us, so. Mm -hmm. I'm curious, I mean, it's such, everybody that's about to watch it or has already watched it knows that it's like in, an incredibly powerful depiction of something that's so real and raw for so many people. I'm curious to know, does the peer community still exist in the same way in 2020? Um, the same way, I, I would say, you know, what is ever really truly the same way. That's the thing about, you know, sure. humans, you know, we, 
we, it, it, what is the thing? You know, the more things change, the more they stay the same. Yep. Which implies that things are changing and things are, you know? So like, I, I think the totally. same challenge, but the thing is, is that the way I look at it, all queer people in the Western world are the peer children of Sylvia Rivera and Marsha P. Johnson. Mm. So as long as there are out queer people you know, um, having gay pride, getting married, being in the military, adopting children and all the things that we've been able to fight for in the wake of Sylvia and Marsha and the Stonewall Rebellion, yeah. right? So that, you know, yeah, the peer kids are still here. We're all still here. We're all still living in that legacy. Yeah. yeah. We wake up and we are uh, an active political, we are a political statement in itself just be just existing <laughs> I think we forget that sometimes um, because we've come a long way in some ways and in other ways we really have so much more to go um, what was your do you remember the seed of the motivation to make this like where did it start for you um, well you know I think the kind of the the place that it starts for me is through my experience. I spent 10 years of my life homeless mm. from the age of 16 to 25 because my mother couldn't accept my sexuality. I've grown up going to the city when you're broke, you know, like if you don't mm. have a job, you can go to New York and you can go look at buildings and because it's free. And then you go home and you've done something besides sit at home all day, you know? Right. So when I left, I went to the train station and I saw these three black gay men who seemed to be having the time of their lives. Um, and I assumed that they were gay because of how they were acting in public. And I was just quite, you know, fascinated with them and how they could be like that in public. And I didn't even think you could be like that in public. So right. I, and they were going to the pier and they, I didn't introduce myself or anything. I just kind of walked behind them. And once I arrived, I saw a whole, this whole world I had no idea existed with full of these people who are black like me and queer like me and trans like themselves and lesbians mm -hmm. and all these, you know, just the whole situation going on. And what was really cool about it is that they kind of seemed to understand what brought me there without me have without me having to say a word. And mm -hmm. that level of understanding was something that was very kind of impactful to me, something I needed that so did you like your story is very similar to the some of the stories depicted in the film or like did you see yourself in them yes yes i did um each of them kind of represents some aspect of how my kind of intersectional identity um mm -hmm. propelled me forward into adulthood because I was so curious, like, how did you, what was your entry point into this, into these lives? It's so intimate and it's so raw. It is to, well, to have them trust you. Well, when I started the film about a month into shooting, um, well, okay, so the place it starts from, I'm at Columbia University, years okay. ago. And um, I'm on campus and kids are finishing, we're finishing up the year. They're my mm -hmm. semester was everybody else's last semester. So I'm watching these college age kids go home at the end of the semester. And I'm constantly asking myself, like, well, what is this for me? Like, who's excited that I come back? Who understands me without saying a word? And I look up one day and I'm on the pier. And I'm like, oh. And I look around again and I see what I saw for the first time when I was 16. Only this time I had spent years in the military as a combat filmmaker. So mm. I had, and I had, and I was also at a university, a research university that kind of gave me a way to frame this curiosity, uh, in a, in a, it really, in the, and it's this, for me, what became a cinematic way, which is to try to express one's experience through like visuality, yep. you know, so that they can have evidence of yeah. what you say to be true. Which we're seeing now in the world, how much video evidence has been the, the change 
the change we needed or a part of the change we needed to prove this is really happening. Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. So, um, so yeah, so I went out and I bought the camera that I used in the Marines and I began filming and it, and then when you act, talk about the level of access and the trust that I built with these characters, I think I have to mention that Crystal Labasia really got me on the path to gotcha. making a film, right? Going from that mm -hmm. place, let me just go around and ask all these people who look like me why they're here and how they feel being here, right? Crystal helped me understand that home is the place where a person is most deeply understood. Mm. When she challenged me, she said about a month into filming, because in the Marines, there's this very kind of didactic way that movies are made. You point a camera, you ask a question, ask a few more, and that's it. You're supposed to get it. And you give it to somebody who's higher up and they say, okay, I get it. And they move on to the next thing. And right. I tried that style and it kind of led me to a wall. And Crystal said to me, if you want to tell my story, then you have to be my friend. You have to be on my side when things go bad. And you have to be here to witness my existence for me as much as it is for you. And yeah. that informed the rest of how I made the film. I changed from showing up with this tripod and the wide and this very kind of talking head news type of thing into uh, essentially trying to put the camera on my shoulders almost as if it's my own yeah. head and to bring the audience front and center. What do you want people to take away from the film after they've watched it? Yes, I want people to have been a peer kid for 84 minutes, to mm -hmm. rely on community for support and to survive and for survival, you know? And I want that experience to inform the way that they vote. I want them to dedicate themselves to using their life force to make it easier for communities like this to form support networks and to help each other overcome homelessness. There are 2 million homeless people, young people in the United States, 40% of them are LGBT youth, half of them are LGBTQ youth of color. So this is a problem that has been going on since the very beginning of time, at least of gay time since 1969. Yeah. You know, and it continues to this day and it won't stop unless we really decide that it has to stop. And I want this film to make a whole army of people into those deciders. Nice. Yeah, I mean, it's about, like we said, showing people that it exists in 2020, the way you showed that it exists and that these are people that it's not what you expect necessarily because there is the community that you show. And yet there's also just so much about like, I stole because I had to, I don't, I know I don't want to steal, but I, I had to in order to do that today, or I had to sell my body today. I don't want to have to do that, but I, need to in order to survive and I think you you do an amazing job of showcasing just the reality of that dilemma so many people are privileged enough to not even have to ever have thought about that when you mentioned the fact that they have no choice I just wanted to offer that this and another thing about this film is that this film revels in the choices that they make even right seemingly don't have a choice this is a film about the power of agency and the possibility that by making different choices that you can lift yourself out of homelessness and we can end homelessness. So I just mm. want to, you know, this is not just about people who are between a rock and a hard place. This is about right. whose choices matter, whose lives matter at the, the, the level at which they make these choices and we should support their survival no matter what. Right, even if they're doing things that we might think are illegal or morally whatever, we have to mm -hmm. understand that they are in a situation where their survival is not promised and their lives still matter. Well, that we might as well just go right into that uh, the question or the conversation about how we solve 
homelessness. I mean, that's a huge mountain I realize. Um, but in your, you have a unique perspective on this. Somebody who has been homeless, somebody who, who showcased through the lens what it looks like or what it can look like. And even just what you said about the agency that these people have still to make choices in their life, even though they're homeless. I think uh, what you've got to do is educate young people uh, categorically. Uh, mm -hmm. All that you possibly can. Lots of people, like illiteracy and, um, I mean, truly illiteracy is one of the, the kind of feeder conditions into homelessness, which can lead you to prison, at times HIV infection. So yeah. just by making sure that every child in America is equally literate, you will have a positive impact on this issue. And I think the real answer is that people who have in a society have to be concerned with those who have not and be yeah. without a solution, no matter how messy or inconvenient, right, that can allow for some sort of progress to be made. These folks have made you has in, have entertained you against insurmountable odds that there are thousands of people who have done the things that you're watching on screen who have been obliterated by poverty in this country who have been wiped off the face of the earth only to leave behind these dances and this way of being glamorous in this way you know and we have to if that it, it's not fair to expect people who are already under so much duress to also then pull themselves up by them, their bootstraps while a system is actively pushing them down. Yes, I mean, Pose is an amazing step forward for Hollywood and, and for mainstream society. And I was gonna ask you what you think of Pose because clearly this has done some good, but it also is ironic that at the same time, is it really lifting up the people that it actually is talking about in the show? So, um, yeah, like when I look at shows like Pose, the girls who are on screen, the people who are on screen are from the community that they are depicting, and they are rising to a place of prominence in our culture, and that is progress. However, mm -hmm. We have to look deeper than the screens in front of us and on Instagram accounts and think about, and, and, and really I think a lot of people on the show, especially India would agree that the whole point of them rising to this place in society is so that the larger mainstream society reaches back down yes. and makes sure that there are more opportunities for all. And I think that that's happening. I think that the normalization of the television thing is happening, but we can't conflate celebrity with the meaningful dismantling of systemic oppression, right? Absolutely. I think it's, I think there's lots of people that have assumed we're further than we are because Oprah exists, because JC and Beyonce exists, because the like exceptions exist and even pose like Billy Porter, like, we love ya. It's a, you. You are defying and and showing what's possible. And yet you're right there. We have to reach back and open the door and keep it open. And continue to lift up Billy. Billy is a powerhouse. Absolutely. Powerhouse. They absolutely deserve this platform and are doing amazing things with this platform. You know, I, I would never want to I don't want to mince words about that. I really have a lot of respect for the performers. hundred percent. Possible, but even they're going to tell you they're trying to reach back in their own ways and we need to help them out. You know, that's how we end homelessness. We have to reach back for people that mm -hmm. are being, that we, that are being made obsolete by an economy that is unrelenting and disinterested in care. There's two sides of this, right? There's the system that, we're at, that we need to change so that homelessness has not become an eventuality for certain groups yeah. of people. But then there's the individual who is homeless, right? So for those individuals who are homeless and you want to be homeless, you have to be relentless.
Yeah. Like it's bone. You know, you will have to fight tooth and nail against everything in a society because this is a society that is against poor people. Yeah. You know, they would rather you die of COVID. Yeah. Right. Than have free health care. And then there's the level of just what the system has created for people of color versus just even a white homeless person versus you know somebody who's of, of color that I'm I'm that changes the game even even more. And then add in being trans um, to that as well. How was it to go into the the really personal lives of of Crystal's family. Ma, all I'm asking you to do is just see me. That's it. I don't know her as Krista. This is my nephew. What's wrong with taking this lifestyle, setting it outside your mother's door? Did, like, I mean, what was that like in the room with Crystal's mom, whom, you know, and, and even Anne, who, like, there was different levels of acceptance and to sit there and, you know, be the, the fly on the wall, but very much be there. Um, what was the energy like? I mean, even Crystal, I mean, there's only so much you can get from seeing it, but like, what do you remember from the energy of the room? I remember being bowled over. I mean, it, first of all, some of the things coming out of the relatives' mouths were just heinous, respectful on this level that I, I mean, I, I've experienced in my own household, sure. But to see it happen to someone else that at this point we're friends. So this is my friend this is happening to. This isn't just yeah. what I'm making a movie about, right? This is I'm still friends with Crystal. We talk today. Yeah. So I felt really like upset for Crystal. But then yeah. I was, it's like, you know, it's just the most heinous stuff. And then I'm confused because the, as the aunt is being transphobic, she's sewing hair, she's doing her hair. Feminine way, and I'm just, and she asked for permission and Chris to say transphobic things, and Crystal grants permission, and then somewhere along that, I have realized that Crystal's actually a genius. That because when you ask what it's to take in homelessness, it's all of it. It's like it's like HIV. You know, HIV is this disease or COVID that interacts in human behavior in all of these ways that require like a real systemic change in order to make it less spreadable, less fatal. Yep. yep. Homelessness. And what Crystal shows me is that people within the LGBT community, there has to be something called radical patience. Mm. Has to be something called radical patience for black people as well, dealing with white folks as well. I'm not saying that we have to put our grievances down, but I am saying that we have to be willing to listen to what someone has to say. You know, we have to be willing to listen to something so that maybe, and, and what Crystal does by listening is that she creates a window of opportunity that a little seed that she's able to plant because she's heard. 100%. And she now can use her, her radical empathy to, to level with them and say, hey, I haven't, the thing that you should be, instead of looking at me as someone who has like deceived you, look at me as someone who loves you so much that I waited until I left your home before I did this transition. And I came back. And I came back. She came back to have the conversation. So it takes time and it's just that, that, yes, radical, that radical empathy, we, we have to empathize even with the people who don't understand us. Otherwise we can't even, can't even sit with them. Yes. You know, it's at least if it, it's, it's, it's the patience and the love, patience, love, mm -hmm. and, right? All of this can help to end homelessness. Yep. So the funeral scene was so moving and raw. And I was so curious, this is just a personal question. Did you ever, was that on the floor at all? Was it on the cutting floor ever? Was it always in the movie? Like, was that always going to be a part of it? Um, I think for this film, one of the goals is to place the audience within the skin of oppression. Mm -hmm. 
and contend with being a peer kid themselves. And this, that scene was never on the cutting room floor because that consequence, you asked me earlier how I resonated with each one of these characters, the major characters and how I identify with them and with Casper, it's the risk of this lifestyle. You are growing up outdoors. You're growing up in a risky situation and yeah. be the sweetest kid in the world. And you go to see your trans girls room at two o'clock in the morning. And because you don't feel comfortable being in public with her in the daytime, you're not seen by two hit, hit, two hit and run drivers and you're gone. And the people that like with him and his mother, they, there's a lot left unresolved. It's funny to talk about it now because I'm going through something like that with my family. So, you know, mm. I wonder karmically how much that has to do with what's going on in my life when I think about it. But um, yeah, there's a lot of stuff that can get left unresolved. So for parents who are kicking their kids out, you know, figure it out because they may not be here tomorrow. Right. They may not... A lot of folks, a lot of black folks think that they're practicing tough love. I'm going to show you the negative consequence and then you're going to change because you don't want that to continue. And that's not what happens. Your kids just die. Yeah. And if you don't want your kids to die, accept them. Where are, like you, you keep in touch with Crystal, where are, where are some of the other characters in the film now? Like, are have they been able to to find their way out of homelessness or sex work or yeah. what is that relationship like now? Cause this was almost a decade ago. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, uh, quite a few of them have like found jobs. I mean, this is pre COVID now. So things are, right. back, you know, and unfortunately for a lot of people of color, you know, black folks, you can get, you, you finally get to that place where it feels like things are connecting and you're going to be okay. And then COVID comes along and I think everybody can identify with that right now. So yeah, so some of them had found jobs in like you know, malls and like Sunglass Hut, I, one, one of the characters. Um, another of the characters you know, has gone, gone on to school and like learned, you know, trades and things of that nature. Mm -hmm. Many of them are not have not found stable housing still. Yeah. Again, it's, it's almost impossible to overcome homelessness in this country. There's nothing really being done to make it easier for people to do. Another way to help with homelessness is to change the perspective of like curing homelessness even, right? That right. reality, what we are providing is triage and support and we are trying to create behavioral changes and societal changes that create a result where someone cannot be homeless but very often just like addiction and many of the things that are connected to homelessness this is a process this is not something that yeah. just goes away you have to really really try so you know crystal's married you know she's been with her husband still to this day they're as in love today as they were she's got a job she's got a place you know, so yeah. figured it out. But many of them have not, and I I just want to say let's let's go back for them now. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Let's yeah, everybody. So I mean, we've talked about some of these things already. One of my last questions was, what does what does progress really look like after making this film? You know, in 2020, when we're about to make some hopefully monumental changes in the government and what is what does the change continue to look like for you well for myself i mean and this is what I, i'm gonna talk be selfish and then talk about your question but you know for me i've got a lot of great things on the horizon uh no matter who the president of the united states is you know i've got a feature film by the name of the inspection which i'll be shooting uh it's a fiction film i'll be shooting i believe in like february of next year and the movie nice. is a homeless gay youth who joins the Marine Corps to change his life, but then has to uh, conceal his attraction to his drill instructor in order to survive boot camp. It's set during Don't Ask, Don't Tell, 2005, Iraq War troop surge. Um, I can't wait to show it to you guys. So there's that. 
And then, you know, in terms of the society progress, you know, this is a tough thing. It's a tough pill to swallow for a lot of, you know, white folks, but they're going to have to come up off of some of that privilege. Yes. I have to let, you're going to have to give some of it away because if you don't give it away, the earth will take it from you. Yeah. So that real progress has to be about a, 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 a meaningful, you know, a silent majority, a new silent majority that is interested in a new world where being white does not automatically guarantee an easier life. And that is mm-hmm. something highly difficult to let go of. You know, I, I'm not, I can imagine how that, how the anxiety, I mean, you see the anxiety that this truth causes white America yep. right now, killing people on the street as much for, you know, the, a fear that this person, if they don't kill one of them, then a dozen of them will come and kill them. And they're not wrong if they keep doing this behavior, as we see, you know, nothing is promised. These cities can burn. Yeah. Yeah. So I think that, you know, going forward, just accept the fact that some of the privilege you've, that you've enjoyed in your life has not been achieved through any sort of fair system and do the best you can do to address that in your lifetime. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. truly, and listen, like that's one of the things that I've, I've really been paying attention to and just being conscious of in the last six months. Just if you do, if it's not your experience, listen to somebody who can tell you about the experience rather than speaking for them. Um, so that they can, so that you can, and really listen. So you really can know, get a little taste of, of what this is really like, which you have done in Pure Kids to just really know what it's like to be a trans woman of color in America. This is a phrase we now throw around in the queer gay community as like, they're the bottom. But do you know what that means? Do you really know what that means when you say that? And if you watch Pure Kids, you will, you will have a better idea of what that means. And maybe you won't throw that phrase around lightly. Thank you so much for saying that. That's really, thank you. No, well, thank you for making this amazing documentary. And, and I hope everybody at the festival enjoys it. I hope everybody's, everybody's enjoyed this, this chat and conversation, this candid queer conversation that we have been able to have. Is there anything else that you wanted to say about the project or the stories? I, I just want to give the floor to you. Wow, thank you. Um, I just want to say that, I, I guess, thank you again for watching the film. Thank you and try your very best to do better. You know, I think one of the things I've learned in the Marine Corps is the idea of, of self-improvement as a mantra. And I think the easiest way to improve yourself is to be kind to others. So mm-hmm. be, be nice to each other. Yeah. Love it. Well, everybody, the uh, the Real Pride Film Festival takes place from Tuesday, October 13th to Sunday, October 18th. Uh, please enjoy the festival. We'll put a link in the description to to go watch it. Everything's virtual, so you can watch from from anywhere. Uh, and please check out Pure Kids. It is something that will it will change your life. So enjoy the festival. If you've never been to the Queer Network, obviously subscribe. We do so much, so much more than, than queer conversations. We have a queer talk show. So come check that out. And remember, keep it queer and follow me at Elegance Brown. <laughs> Absolutely. Oh my gosh. We'll put all of your information into the description as well. And right. you, I'm sure you have some social media presence to be following along with as you continue making these amazing films. Thank you. It's nice to meet you. Absolutely. Nice to meet you too. All right. Thanks everybody for watching. We'll see you next time. Bye. Mm-hmm.